Good evening. Good evening. I am loving the turnout tonight. This is great. Yes, so you're excited. This is wonderful. So um, I'm Cynthia Guidry. I'm the director of Long Beach Airport, and it is indeed my honor uh, and pleasure to, to really welcome you uh, here this evening. Um, gosh, we have some great, great uh, conversation and presentations uh, that will happen tonight, but certainly um, with our recently commissioned Centennial Report, which details Long Beach Airport's incredible 100 years of aviation and sheds light on a few lesser known stories. Um, this really is so important that we share more of our rich history. I do want to start out by thanking the Long Beach Public Library for allowing us to, to be here tonight. Uh, please give them a hand. And also to, uh, I believe I saw a couple of airport advisory commission commissioners here, so just thank you for being here as well. But I'm going to say a few remarks before I introduce our councilwoman, Kerr. But today, today, we're building upon Long Beach Airport's reputation as one of the best airports in the nation. Uh, we are, and I get to say that, but we are, we are ranked among the top 10 um, uh, airports. And in fact, for our second year in a row, we have been uh, voted by Condé Nast Traveler magazine, the readers that, that look at that uh, uh, magazine as the best, one of the best in the top 10 in the nation. And it's really a, a great honor to be able to say that and have that for our city uh, and for our airport. But many of you who have flown through Long Beach Airport know we really do get to celebrate um, just having a, a wonderful um, aesthetic at the airport. We have a beachside vibe. We're very easy to access. I mean, it's just really, really great to have, have this airport in our city. And, and you know, our open air concourse, um, just the ability to really relax and offer that to the travelers is so important to, to us and to, to our, our public. And, and I hope many of you in the, in the room. But we're at a time where we have 24 non-stop destinations at Long Beach Airport. That is more than we've ever had in our 100 year history. And, and that really is, um, just speaks to the partnership that we have with our air carriers who are doing a, a phenomenal job. And so we are a priceless resource. Um, I do believe that you know, for, for our community and the convenience that we offer to travelers, uh, we really are a place uh, that is an economic engine creating thousands of jobs right here in this city. And so it does uh, attract a lot of investment, a lot of interest uh, for, for our city and our local economy. But beyond celebrating the 100 year milestone, it's an exciting year for Long Beach Airport because we will we'll also complete the restoration of our historic terminal. And many of you know that is in the works right now. And, and I had a little peek this week of where we are in our renovation. And I can't wait uh, for that to really be revealed and back open to the public. You will completely love it. Because, and I, I'm confident in saying that because it, it, it shows so much promise right now. And, and so just really excited about that. Uh, but, but finally, um, our inherited legacy that I get to participate. Um, and, and, you know, I really want to take a pause because I like to acknowledge, you know, we're at a time where, yes, it's 100 years, this airport is going through a transformation. But for those of us, and our airport team is here, for those of us that work there, we get the honor of being there and stewarding this great airport. Um, and it is absolutely beautiful. So with that, um, the work that we do wouldn't be possible without the great support of our community and local legislators, including Councilwoman Megan Kerr, who was here to say a few words. So come on up. Councilwoman. Thank you. So there's really not much more to say. <laughs> good evening, everyone. It's so good to be with all of you. Uh, 
As Director Guidry said, my name is Megan Kerr and I have the honor of representing the 5th District of Long Beach on the City Council. I am a born and raised Long Beach girl. I grew up in Bixby Highlands, currently live in Bixby Knolls and have watched planes go over my house and around my airspace for my entire life, from C-17s to general aviation and everything in between. And as Director Guidry said, it's so important to tell the stories that maybe we haven't heard yet or we've heard a little bit about because we continue to build on those today and into the future. So this was the first 100 years of this airport and the transformation that's happening is gonna take our community um, and the aviation space industry into the future. And I'm so excited to, again, as you said, steward that and be a little bit of part of the history. So thank you so much for coming out tonight. I am super grateful that you are all here to hear these stories. And, and that's all I need to say. So I'm gonna introduce, actually, uh, Dr. Pandia from the Long Beach Historical Society to tell you a little bit more. Thank you, Councilwoman, and thank you everybody for coming. For those of you who may not know, the Historical Society of Long Beach preserves our rich past for our local communities and for scholars through archival collections, exhibitions, and programs. When our executive director, Julie Bartolo, uh, excuse me, Julie Bartolotto, excuse me, fell ill, um, she asked me to say a few words on her behalf. I agreed instantly because this report is important. It helps recover a forgotten history. How aviation and later aerospace remade Long Beach and Southern California. A quick example. Through the mid-1960s, aerospace was the spine of the regional economy. And as late as the mid-1980s, nearly half a million LA County residents worked for private defense firms in the US military. Assembly houses, engineering firms, metal shops were among the thousands of businesses that carpeted the LA basin and Orange County, only to pick up again on the other side of Camp Pendleton in San Diego. This report, though, helps eliminate two dimensions of this story that have been especially obscured. The story of aerospace's infrastructure, the municipalities, the airports, the regional agencies, the public-private partnerships that supported its growth, and especially the story of women and minority communities who shaped and were shaped by aerospace. This report does a wonderful job of making these two features of aerospace's past visible. Just to toot our own horn, I quickly wanted to note some of the materials from this report that were found in the archives of the Historical Society. In Long Beach's director of aeronautics, Nicholas Dallas's files, the early city manager files, are. Douglas Aircraft Collection and our extensive photographic and newspaper collections. So on behalf of the Historical Society of Long Beach, I would like to congratulate the airport on its centennial and the release of this fascinating report on its history. I would also like to thank Dr. Jefferson and Dr. Hart for producing this rich document, as well as our talented team at the Historical Society for all their hard work uh, in helping with this research. Thank you. Thank you, Councilwoman Kerr, and thank you, Dr. Pandia. Uh, I would like to extend uh, my gratitude to the Historical Society um, for your support um, and in, in this work and, and all that we're doing tonight. I'd also like to mention the, the two authors that we have here, and we have a special, special uh, evening plan, but we have First, award-winning report authors, Dr. Allison Rose Jefferson and Dr. Philip Hart. And we appreciate both of them for they have brought uh, really these personal stories to life, especially um, recentering the experiences of women and people from the black, Latinx, Asian, indigenous, and other communities of color. 
I learned some things. Some of Long Beach's aviation history involves household names. But equally captivating in this report are the lesser known stories, the untold stories of individuals like Monty Montijo, an accomplished Mexican-American aviator and businessman from the 1920s. Or Henry Oye, a second generation Japanese-American commercial pilot who organized an annual air race. Their narratives enhance our understanding of Long Beach Airport's diverse aviation history. And it's important that we share these stories. We learn these stories. We're so fortunate to have this report, uh, insightful authors here uh, with us. Uh, Dr. Jefferson, the project leader, is an award-winning author and historian who has worked extensively across Los Angeles and Southern California to elucidate and recenter the black experience in American history. Dr. Hart is a retired professor, prolific author, and document documentary filmmaker best known for being one of the authorities on early black aviators and his family's work in the aviation industry extends back generations. Thank you for that. So thank you to both Dr. Jefferson and Dr. Hart for helping us reflect on our past at Long Beach Airport while we celebrate this special 100 year milestone and embrace our future. I take great pride in the legacy we continue to build right here at Long Beach Airport. We are the coolest airport in America. Please welcome Dr. Hart. Thank you. All right, well, thank you all for coming out tonight. And um, we're going to give you a taste of uh, uh, we're going to give you a taste of everything that we have inside of uh, the report, and we hope that you will, uh, you know, take a little time to go through our report because we can't tell you about everything. <laughs> uh, you know, tonight. We can't tell you about everything. And somebody's going to come up and say, oh, you didn't say something about that. Well, you know, we only have uh, 40 minutes. <laughs> okay. So Southern California uh, has now, for over a century, been at the center of uh, air and space flight uh, experimentation and manufacturing reshaping and challenging the region's economy, uh, culture, demographics, uh, environment, uh, political landscape, and the human imagination. Long Beach Airport was at the center of the development on November 23, 1923, when city officials had the vision to establish the first municipally owned airfield in the American West. Today, Phil Hart and I are going to talk about some of uh, what we learned in our, uh, uh, our research project, and the name of it is up there on, on the screen. And uh, it encompasses, uh, it encompasses um, uh, the histories and significance of Long Beach and Southern California aviation activities from uh, uh, the early 20th century decades into the 1980s. In our work, we found, uh, as, as uh, 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 Director Gutri has said, we found hidden and overlooked and forgotten stories about local Long Beach figures, women, and black, Latinx, Asian, indigenous, and other people of color uh, uh, who contributed to making uh, the Southern California environs an aviation and aerospace industrial center. We hope uh, you will be inspired uh, to learn more about uh, these histories and, and maybe some others, uh, but these histories that we uh, discuss tonight and uh, explore in our essay. How many people here in our uh, audience have knowledge of uh, the origins of flying in Long Beach in Southern California in the early 20th century? 
Okay, okay, all right. Um, at the center of, uh, 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 at, at the turn of the 20th century, before airplanes flew, uh, uh, before airplanes uh, 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 flew over the city of Long Beach and the California landscape, hot air balloons passed through the skies when uh, these contraptions were popular worldwide. In 1905, uh, uh, one was used in marketing as a special attraction of, uh, of daring stunts to be performed from uh, uh, this airship to entice summer visitors uh, to the new Long Beach Oceanfront Amusement Park, the Pike, at the former uh, Pine Avenue Pier, marking the beginning of aviation history in the city. Simultaneously, shortly uh, after Wilbur and Orville Wright's 1903 uh, successful demonstration of uh, an airplane's capability of uh, um, power to sustain flight, California's enthusiasm for flying began and intensified during the next few decades. The state's clear skies, moderate climate, and abundant cheap land became the tools to uh, uh, promote aeronautics and aviation in the development of aircraft and airfields and in the attraction of aviators, uh, air machine builders, risk takers, and entrepreneurs. Airfields would become symbols of uh, the future as Southern California was starting uh, its ascension to being the aviation capital of the United States. Initially, an airplane was a novelty that was used uh, in, in air stunt exhibitions, but at the same time, it was also viewed by many as technological progress towards a new, modern, alluring, and potentially practical transportation method. In 1910, Regional uh, civic leaders and business community members seized the opportunity to stage the Los Angeles International Air Meet, which was viewed as an economic development and marketing tool to encourage people to visit, uh, move to, and invest in the region. The 10-day program held from January 10th to uh, uh, to 20th was the first official major international air show on U.S. soil. American aviators and uh, aircraft, uh, American aviator and aircraft builder uh, uh, Glenn Curtis won the international air meet held uh, in August 1909 in Reims, France, and the rules specify uh, the rules specifying that. Uh, uh, the, and, and then there were rules that specified that the winner, uh, the winning nation, would host uh, would host the next uh, uh, air meet. Curtis was based in uh, Hammondsport, New York, and his uh, and uh, uh, along with his flying colleagues, uh, they brought this event to Southern California because of. Uh, what did I say about our weather? Our mild uh, winter weather and uh, our, our, our wide open spaces. The Southern California competition featured European pilots, European and American pilots uh, of monoplanes, biplanes, hot air balloons, blimps, and a few experimental machines that never got off the ground uh, in competition. And there was prize money. The Los Angeles Times called this air meet one of the greatest public events in the history of the West. It marked uh, the advent of Southern California's aviation age as the city of Los Angeles and vicinity were becoming internationally significant due to the film industry, oil, and the new port. About 255,000 fascinated spectators from all over Southern California, including Long Beach and beyond, uh, bought tickets to attend the event. Every relevant American who was a flyer, 
potential manufacturer or investor in aviation at the time was in attendance. Nine-year-old Florence Lowe, who became known as uh, the aviator Pancho Barnes by the late 1920s, attended with her grandfather, Thaddeus Lowe. Does anybody know who Thaddeus Lowe was? Yes. Who, who was he? He was a balloonist during the Civil War, and he, he, he built a railway up to the top of Mount Paul. All right, I'm glad to know that you know that. Yes, he was, he was, the, chief aeronaut, he was the chief aeronaut uh, of the Union Army, uh, Observation Balloon Corp during the Civil War, and some claim uh, him as the father of the U.S. Air Force. And Boeing was in attendance at this first air show as well. He was in timber at that point in time trying to get into aviation. The air meet received uh, worldwide press and moving picture newsreel uh, program coverage, helping to establish air flight as something that uh, was not a novelty. The world got the opportunity to view the superiority of the biplane for flight and the airplane manufacturers would take this cue to build them as warplanes for World War I. The continued presence of the aviation and aerospace industries as an economic driver in the Southern California region and national economies is the biggest resonating legacy of this pivotal January 1910 event and the three other air meets that took place uh, before 1913, all held at Dominguez Hill up the road a bit. Glenn Curtis was uh, spurred on to open a flight school in San Diego where he trained armed forces members and civilians to fly. Long Beach would see the beginning of local entrepreneurs constructing and flying their own aircraft before the U.S. Uh, entered World War I in 1917. The Long Beach shoreline became the local airfield for a few years until one was constructed inland first by uh, aviation uh, uh, entrepreneur Earl, uh, Earl Dowdy and then by the Long Beach municip municipality. Frank Champion and Earl Darty began uh, their intense infatuation with flying at the 1910 air meet and became the first two Long Beach officially licensed airplane pilots in 1911. They would have many aviation accomplishments in their lifetime. Georgia Tiny Broadwick of Long Beach became uh, the first woman to parachute from an airplane that Glenn Martin manufactured, Martin Marietta, Glenn Martin uh, manufactured and piloted in 1913. Cal Rogers <clears throat> completed the first transcontinental flight from Long Island, New York on the Atlantic Ocean to the Long Beach shoreline near where Pine Avenue ends today on December 10, 1911. His Vin Fizz Flyer is uh, on display at the Smithsonian National Air and Space Museum, and a replica is displayed in the San Diego Air and Space Museum to honor and expose people to the regional and national history of the landing of uh, uh, this first transcontinental flight. Although not so remembered uh, uh, in uh, popular memory today, Blanche Stewart Scott was the first woman aviator to perform in uh, the 1912 air meet, along with Tom Gunn, the first licensed Chinese American pilot. Bringing tremendous publicity to the event, both performed aerial stunts with the best aviators uh, of the world. Although his name is not uh, maybe as remembered uh, in households today, Gunn is viewed as a significant influencer of early Pacific region uh, aviation development. Los Angeles's Earl uh, Darty uh, flew, uh, uh, flew in the uh, 
uh, flew in the last of uh, the air meets in early 1913, where he did uh, flight events that would go on to be useful in combat warfare during uh, World War I, which would be a testing ground for the capabilities of uh, aviators and airplanes as, uh, as, uh, uh, as warfare tools. Darty and other aviation-minded businessmen of Long Beach would participate in uh, various uh, air uh, 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 record uh, uh, competitions and stunt performances around the U.S. as they built uh, airplanes uh, that they would fly from the shores of Long Beach until World War I enlisted them uh, uh, and others into service. And also during this time, the United States Navy would begin training pilots on the Long Beach shoreline in, uh, in 1915. So now I'm going to turn it over to my co-author, uh, Phil Hart. Which one should I hear? Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Allison. Allison is the hardest working woman in show business. Um, Earl Doherty, as Allison uh, makes reference to, returned to Long Beach after World War I service and opened a school of aviation in 1919 at Bixby Road and Long Beach Boulevard in Chateau, the Chateau Thierry, Thierry Sec tract uh, in, in Long Beach. Uh, and he set up an aviation school. Other uh, significant uh, pilots in Long Beach who were colleagues of, 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 of Mr. Doherty were Frank Champion, as Allison mentioned, Monty Mojito, who uh, the airport director referred to, and Art Ebright, who was a real estate agent, as well as a, a pilot, and used to fly clients over Long Beach, showing them this land is available here. So he was very, very uh, in innovative aviator. Um, Bessie Coleman, one of those unknown stories, came to Los Angeles in 1923 to participate in an air show. She was sponsored by the Coast Tire and Rubber Company, being the first black pilot to have corporate support. And I have a Bessie Coleman quarter. During the time that, that Allison and I were working on this project, the U.S. Mint minted a Bessie Coleman quarter. How many of you have a Bessie Coleman quarter? <laughs> uh, my wife and I, who's sitting here, Tanya Hart, we did a podcast on Bessie Coleman scripted podcast, eight episodes, and my nephew, who's a Long Beach resident, Meredith McLaughlin, who's sitting here, is a voiceover talent. He did voiceover for us on it. <laughs> now, the same year that Bessie Coleman came to uh, Los Angeles in 1923, uh, Long Beach launched, launches its municipal airport. And then in 1924, the Long Beach Airport is dedicated at Cherry Avenue and Spring Street. And we're here today to commemorate that centennial. Um, uh, and then soon thereafter, James Herman Banning, who is my mother's uncle, came to Long Beach and became the chief pilot for the Bessie Coleman Aero Club. The Bessie Coleman Aero Club was founded here in Los Angeles in 1929 by William Powell. William Powell, you see on this photo, he's the gentleman on the right. To the left, those of you who are boxing fans recognize Joe Lewis. This is at the uh, Bessie Coleman Aero, uh, Aero Club aeronautics class uh, that was held at Jefferson High School in Los Angeles. This is the, uh, uh, the O'Donnell School of Aviation. In 1928, Lloyd O'Donnell and his wife Gladys opened the O'Donnell School of Aviation here in Long Beach. Gladys O'Donnell became known as the Flying Housewife. <laughs> and uh, there's a recent documentary that, that says that her husband, who taught her how to fly, became quite jealous of her because she was uh, exceeding him in terms of her accomplishments. And those of you who are married, you may know that story. <laughs> uh, in uh, 1928, uh, my mother's uncle, James Herman Banning, learned to fly 
Uh, he moved to L.A. in 1929, rather. He earned his license in 1926 in Ames, Iowa. He was an stu engineering student at Iowa State College. So he earned his license in 1926, becoming the first African American to earn a pilot's license in the United States. Uh, he moved to L.A. in 1929, uh, recruited by William Powell to be the chief pilot for the Bessie Coleman Aero Club. And here you see Poncho Barnes and Kate, Kate warned us that there would be announcements. <laughs> it's like being at the airport doing a <laughs> flight 75 is landing. Shut up. Um, here is uh, Florence, Poncho Barnes, and Amelia Earhart. Allison talked about Poncho Barnes. You, you all know who Amelia Earhart is. Who does not know who Amelia Earhart is? Thank you. Who, know, who does not know who Bessie Coleman is now? Everybody knows who Bessie Coleman is now, right? Um, this is a colored air circus. How many of you knew that there was a colored air circus held at the East Side Airport in LA? The first one was on October 31st, 1931. This was the second one that was held on December 6th, 1931 at the request of the mayor of LA, John Porter, and the uh, LA County Supervisor to raise money for the unemployment fund of Los Angeles. If you remember, we're in the great, midst of the Great Depression. So here you see the colored air circus. If you, saw, if you saw the first episode of Perry Mason, this billboard was seen in one of the episodes. Uh, and you see Hubert Julian, they're standing there. They misspelled his name, they spelled it Rupert Julian. But that was the second colored air circus held at the East Side Airport, which is now, we know as Montbello. This is James Herman Banning and Thomas Allen. My mother's uncle is James Herman Banning, Thomas Allen. They were the first African-American pilots to fly across the country in 1932 from uh, Dicer Airfield in, <coughs> in LA to uh, Valley Stream Airfield in Long Island. And this, this photo, is in the, Air, the uh, Black Wings exhibit at the Air and National Air and Space Museum of Smithsonian, uh, recognizing their, their accomplishment. Now, how many of you have heard of Howard Skippy Smith and Mac Skip Gravel? Raise your hand. Okay, you look at this. These, they, they were parachute jumpers. And Skip died in a, jumping out of a plane and his parachute didn't open. So Skippy decided, I'm going to quit this. I'm going to go and make parachutes. So he went, he went to San Diego and worked for a company in San Diego and then started his own parachute company. So he's probably the first African-American working in the defense industry with his own company, Skippy Smith. Just as a note, I'll tell you the name of the most famous African-American parachute jumper. He, came, he was out of Chicago. Willie Suicide Jones. No. <laughs> Why did, they, why did he have the nickname Suicide? <laughs> and here we have Catherine Sui Fung Chung. She was, a, she was born in Canton, China, and, and came to the US with her, parent, her family in 1921. And she became a licensed pilot you know, when she was uh, in, her in her 20s. Here we have pilots belong to the Japanese Aeronautics Association. And you see, made reference to Henry Oye, right? Uh, the, he was one of the founders of the Japanese Aeronautics, Asso Aeronautics Association and was the one that uh, uh, Cynthia referred to as having the Oye Trophy that starred in, in uh, Long Beach Airport <coughs> in 1965. This is a... Uh, uh, a shot of the early airport, and, and uh, <clears throat> here we have the, uh, let me go back, I don't want to go there, right, right, right now. So, and then in, in 1926, the Air Commerce Act was passed, which meant that the uh, U.S. started licensing pilots through the U.S. Department of Commerce. Prior to that, you could earn, a, you, you had to go to Europe or earn an international license here in the United States. 
So there's a whole regulatory and licensing procedure put in place in 1926 with the, Armed Cor the Air Commerce Act. My mother's uncle was, his license number is number 1324, which means he was the 1324th light pilot to get his license in 1926. And by 1938, Long Beach Airport had four major airlines, United, TWA, American, and Western. And then we move into World War II. World War II launches decades of growth in the aviation and aeronautics industry and the entrance, entrance of more diverse participation. We had the WPA in 1941 and the impact on the Long Beach Airport with the, you know, Ar Long Beach Air Architects, Austin and Wing designed the Long Beach Terminal. Uh, the mosaic tiles are designed by Grace Richardson Clements. And then we have the Tuskegee Experiment in 1941 with the Tuskegee uh, experiment at Tuskegee Institute in Alabama with the, uh, what would become known as the Red Tails. Leads us to Rosie the Riveters in, in World War II. Here we have a photo that's in our photo essay with the two Rosie Riveters doing work here at the Bo Boeing plant in, in Long Beach. And Joseph S. Dunning is one of the early contributors, early employees of, of Boeing, uh, African American uh, employee of, of Boeing, started Boeing in 1940. He was an MIT graduate. See this photo from the MIT Museum? Douglas. Douglas, excuse me, excuse me, thank you. That's why I have, that's why I have Allison to, to correct me when I'm wrong. It did become Boeing. But it did become Boeing, but not at that time. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> Then we have uh, various films about the Tuskegee Airmen in 1995, HBO, and the Red Tails in 2012. And the Tuskegee Airmen are in a, a film that's coming out tomorrow called Masters of the Air. That's going to be on Apple TV. It comes out tomorrow. Steven Spielberg and Tom Hanks. Uh, then the Douglas Aircraft Plant opens on October 17, 1941, on <clears throat> 200 acres next to Long Beach Airport. Rosie the Riveters. Uh, Barbara Erickson, London, Iris Cummings, Critchell, uh, and in the photo you saw Rosie the Riveters, Dora Miles, and Dorothy Johnson. <clears throat> then we have uh, contributors like Maggie G, Maggie G, Chinese American pilot, Hazel Yang Lee, Susan Ann on Cuddy, Leah Hing, Mac, Millie Rock, Rexroth, who is an Oglala Lakota tribe, Native American, uh, Fr Francisco Mercado, and Anthony Acevedo were pioneer ethnic pilots. And then two executive orders, 8802 from FDR and 9981, but Truman uh, led to the increase of African Americans and other ethnicities in the defense industry. And then I'll turn over to Allison for Growing Pains, Long Beach suburbs and aeronautics industry. Okay, so the 1940s and uh, uh, the 1940s through the 1960s uh, gave rise to a whole new uh, era of human flight uh, with uh, the advancements uh, in commercial as well as military aircrafts, um, uh, as well as military aircraft design and the advent of rocketry and um, space travel. New uh, commercial aircrafts were developed that could go uh, longer distances and carry more passengers. And uh, space exploration uh, began uh, to uh, be considered in the late 1940s with Boeing, Douglas, um, McDonnell and North American aviation having uh, significant involvement in, in uh, guided missile development programs. Douglas uh, 
uh, Douglas engineers uh, came up with the first uh, practical application for space travel in 1946 and became the init uh, initial leaders in, in space exploration and developing the rockets to get, uh, uh, get uh, a flying uh, uh, vehicle into space. The U.S became engaged in a space race with the Soviet Union to see what could, uh, uh, to see who could get people into uh, space first. In California, in this era, Sojin uh, Yukawa, uh, John uh, uh, Quincy Tabor Jr., and, uh, uh, and, and Leonard Colasione created opportunities for themselves in aircraft techno technological advancement and in uh, these new aerospace and related industries. One of the few Japanese Americans involved in uh, uh, the aviation industry in production of aircraft research and equipment in the 1960s was flight test engineer uh, Sojin Yukawa. He was a member of uh, the four-man crew that took off from Long Beach Airport in 1970 in the maiden flight of the prototype DC-10 airplane produced by Douglas Aircraft Division of the newly merged McDonnell Douglas Corporation. And he might have also worked with Joseph Dunning, uh, who uh, Phil mentioned earlier, and you saw a picture of because Dunning also worked on this program. So it's just kind of interesting to think about, you know, the pioneers and how they would be seeing themselves uh, uh, in different ways during that time period. So the DC-10 was not only the uh, test of an advanced technological aircraft, but also for the new regulations that set noise standards for all new types of uh, subsonic aircraft in order to receive Federal Aviation uh, Administration approval for airworthiness. Yukawa uh, contributed to uh, this DC-10 aircraft's advanced technological, uh, uh, advanced technology program uh, which was viewed with tremendous hope for solving the environmental noise problems caused by commercial airplanes at um, that time and for the future. A first generation born African American Californian of, of parents who migrated to Los Angeles's Venice community from Louisiana in uh, the 1910s, John Quincy Tabor Jr. became a chemist and worked at several companies on pyrotechnic devices and fuel development, as well as in rocket development, including for the Patriot missile and the Saturn. S-5V Lunar Orbiter, the, uh, the NASA uh, Apollo program uh, that was uh, developed to put humans on the moon. Like uh, Yukawa and Tabor, Leonard Colasion was a first generation American-born citizen and Californian who lived during World War II and the Korean War. He was born in the Watts community to parents who had uh, immigrated to the Los Angeles area from Mexico in the early 1920s. After serving in the Army during the Korean War and earning his BA from UCLA, Colacion was uh, concerned he might not get security clearance for employment in the aerospace industry due to small tattoos that he had uh, obtained on his forearm while he was in the military. Hey, go figure, today that might get you the job. <laughs> okay. So, so with that, um, uh, his, his credentials and his expertise prevailed. For most of his 35-year career, he worked in aerospace research at Rockwell International on many projects, including the Apollo Space Program in the 1960s in Downey, California. And uh, Colasion later worked in Seal Beach, California, um, for Rockwell on satellite development. And tonight, we have two of his children here, Lorraine and Ed, who are sitting here uh, in the second row. And 
I always loved that story about his tattoos. Okay. <laughs> So from equipment production and testing to uh, the astronaut side of uh, space flight as the new era of human flight evolved, there would So from equipment production and testing to the astronaut side of space flight, as the new era of human flight evolved, there would be a few people of color and women who would become supporters of astronauts on the ground, and a few who would become part of uh, the NASA uh, Aeronautics Corp in the 1970s, uh, from the 1970s to the 1990s. And during this time period, too, is uh, starting in actually the 60s, is when you start to see um, some African American and other people of color as commercial pilots. Um, it was a challenge, and uh, when you read our report, you can learn a little bit more ab uh, about all of that challenge to get those jobs. Um, a few of these men and women would have ties uh, to uh, California via their training and, and or growing up in the state. And uh, with all of these people, you can, in terms of space folks too, you can read uh, about them in our uh, report. So there's still so much more collaboration uh, the aviation and aer aerospace and related industries need to do uh, with educational institutions to inspire generations of youth to obtain the education needed uh, to develop more pioneers for the future with the right critical thinking and creative still skills to do the work like some of the pioneers highlighted in our work. Did you have I also want to make note, um, I didn't have a chance to say that, but last June I, I made mention of my, my mother's uncle, James Herman Banning, that Ames, Iowa Airport was renamed after him. It's called the James Herman Banning Ames Municipal Airport now. That airport opened in 1943 and they renamed it after my mother's uncle last June, which is a, a family project, and I'm proud of that. <laughs> now, Alice and I want to close. We're going to kind of share the close, um, uh, and I'll let her close since she's the project leader, uh, and I've got to defer to my project leader. Um, but I just want to say that uh, in, in, in discussing this with Alice, and you look at the evolution of aviation and aeronautics, you're really talking about uh, uh, an evolution of land use and development. The, the Long Beach Airport now is about 1,166 acres. Is that correct, Cynthia, about that amount of acreage? You look at LAX, you look at airports around the country, and the, the, the decisions that the municipalities had to make in terms of how we're going to use uh, certain part p pieces of land in order to promote aviation, in order to allow commercial uh, aviation, uh, civil aviation, and it's been a very important uh, part of many communities around the country in terms of the decisions that we make about uh, building an airport, expanding an airport, the tension that some, sometimes comes with airport expansion, which, which obviously Long Beach is, is, is experienced just like other airports around the country. But uh, um, I'll let Al Allison close, because I know we're getting close to seven o'clock, and uh, I want her to be uh, have the, the closing word in terms of of uh, the kind of the final chapter of our report, which hopefully all of you will read very carefully, and I'll, I, I have all of your email addresses, so I'm going to I'm going to be asking questions. I'm going to be giving a quiz next week, so just be warned. But I'll let Allison have the final word. Okay, so from small workshops and hand-built uh, 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 hand aircraft that was made of wood and fabric, and the first air shows at Dominguez Hill in 1910, to Cal Rogers' transcontinental flight in 1912, to the impact of world wars and the growth 
of aviation uh, and the growth of aviation technological innovations that led the development of big aircraft manufacturing plants to aerospace innovations, Long Beach and its airport have been at the center of the story for over 100 years. The, participa the participation of aviators of black and Latinx, uh, uh, Asian, indigenous, and other people of color in and around uh, uh, Long Beach Airport was limited. However, women aviators have been present in Long Beach from uh, the early days to the present. And now we have a woman leader uh, at the airport who is also from a, a, a community of color. Uh, as noted, and we have women, other Kate, other women in leadership in the airport too. Kate heads communications and her staff has a lot of uh, wonderful women on it. So, so with that, um, uh, uh, as, as we noted earlier, uh, in the 1940s, some communities of color and uh, color members and more women uh, began uh, to gain entry uh, to employment in aviation, aerospace, and related industries. And this included in research, uh, development, uh, and uh, manufacturing, as well as uh, flying. And most, uh, most of these folks got employed with companies that had federal uh, defense contracts. In more recent times, um, we see more people of color and women um, uh, 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 having uh, made uh, some more gains in obtaining positions in, uh, in airport uh, facilities and commercial uh, uh, airline occupations and uh, like I said we have some who are in leadership now too and we have them right here in Long Beach even with the downsizing of uh, many companies over the last 30 years Southern California aerospace industries uh, are still a vital part of the regional economy and uh, no less innovative as important uh, as 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 uh, as an important connector in local, regional, national, and global travel and related uh, aeronautics industries, the Long Beach Airport continues to be a vital economic engine for uh, the airport itself and for the city of Long Beach. And various studies have uh, shown that visitor. Um, Spending visitor spending money in the local economy uh, here in in uh, in the airport and outside of the airport supports both commercial and general aviation operations and employment for the Long Beach Airport and throughout the region. So, with that, I would like to say thank you to uh, the Long Beach Airport uh, 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 staff for inviting Phil and I to um, participate in helping to celebrate the um, uh, 100th anniversary of the airport. And I thank you all for coming out tonight to learn a little bit more about uh, 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 the history of our region. And I hope that you will take time out to look at our um, essay online. <laughs>